class on uh, seven churches of Asia. Um, if you want to be turning to uh, both chapters, kind of be a, a summation of the things that we've been studying and thinking about. And uh, as we start class tonight, would you join me for a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and thank you for our life. We are indeed uh, humbled and uh, just encouraged, Father, that we're able to approach you. We're thankful for this avenue of prayer that we have. Uh, we pray that you convict us with um, its power, Father, with uh, its uh, usefulness, Father, with its um, everything that, Father, this does give us the comfort and the hope that we can approach you, that you listen to us, Father, that you care about the longing of our heart and, Father, with our souls. We are thankful for this study um, as we've been able to examine and look at uh, these seven churches, Father. Help us to see where you're talking to us. Father, help us to see where uh, we need to change. Father, help us to see the areas in which um, we're uh, and we should be encouraged, Father, our strengths. Would you help us, Father, to be uh, humbled there? Father, would you help us to be uh, convicted and um, challenged, Father, where we've found ourselves weak, that we may change, Father, and, and look uh, more like your son. Father, we're thankful for each one that's here, their desire to, to love you and to serve you and to stir one another up to love and good works. And, Father, we pray that you continue to bless them in their efforts. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I read an article I thought it was really fitting as we close uh, this study. It was by Everett Ferguson, uh, and the title was The Churches of Christ, Who We Are and What We Ought to Be. But he says something uh, in here I, I want you to consider, and I wonder if you agree with it or not. I wonder if you, uh, what you think about this. Um, he said, The proper doctrine of the church is a necessary corrective to the individualism of current Western society and religion. Here, I would caution against expressing this high doctrine of the church in the language of incarnation. If we take the image too seriously, it implies too low a view of Christ or too high a view of the church. Jesus was fully human, but without sin. There's a high view of the church in Ephesians, but Christ is still the head of the church. I'm going to read a few parts again. Jesus was fully human. He's, he's cautioning uh, too high a view of the church. Uh, should we be careful with our view, how high a view we give of the church? Um, it's important, he says, but yet Jesus was fully human, but without sin. There's a high view of the church in Ephesians, but Christ is still the head of the church. Do you see how each and every church and each and every letter that was written in chapter 2 and 3 fits in with the argument that Everett Ferguson was making? Can we really have too high a view of the church and diminish the message of Christ? So we'd say, and argue, no, the church, that's the most important thing in the world. Is there any difference between the church and Jesus? Okay. We, we wouldn't worship the church. What else? Any, does this get you thinking or challenge you in any way as you consider this? Now, when you think about the seven churches of Asia and what was happening in each and every church, what, what is it that he's emphasizing every time? H 
How does he begin every letter? Say that again. Okay. He's emphasizing Jesus' role. Or something else. Visitor. Okay. He knows what they do. Yeah, every single time. Jesus' role, he's got his eyes there. Uh, I'm the one who, who, who's standing in the midst of what? The, the lamp stands. I'm in the midst of the churches. I am the true and the faithful one. I am the amen. I'm the one who has the keys uh, of David, right? Every single time he opens up and he talks, the emphasis written to the churches is the Christ of the church. And I think it was really, I don't know, if, you know, couldn't say it any better than, than he said it. There's a high view of the church in Ephesians, but Christ is still the head of the church. Why would they need to know that in Ephesus. Why well, they need to be reminded of that perhaps in um, Thyatira? Why well, they need to know about that in Laodicea? What was the message in Laodicea? What had they come to, to do and to be? Were they not called, right, the church, the called out? Were they not meeting every week? Right? What was wrong with Laodicea, though, in their meetings? Anybody remember? Was it verse 20, chapter 3? Okay. They, they weren't content in uh, verse 7. Yeah, they weren't on fire. They had gotten this, this uh, faulty view. They thought that they were wealthy, that they thought they were blessed, but indeed they were naked. They were blind. They were poor. They had missed it. And why? Who wasn't there? Okay, yeah, and we, we would definitely, uh, that would definitely be implied. We'd say, yeah, he's not here <laughs> because Jesus wasn't there. Remember, Jesus is knocking on the door of this church saying, let me in. Look at it. Uh, Ephesians 3, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on the throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus, we can, we can so deceive ourselves and confuse ourselves in being the church, uh, doing what church does. What is the ch- we, we come together and we worship. We come together and we sing. We, we come together and we pray. We're doing church things. And they got so lost in doing that, it seems, that they forgot what, the, what was the point of that. Who was the rock of that? What was the substance of that? That divorced themselves from the head. Jesus. And I think that's why Everett Ferguson's point and his comments are so, uh, are validated actually by a study of the seven churches of Asia. If we divorce ourselves from the character of Jesus, the actions of Jesus, everything about who Jesus is, we stop becoming the church. We are no longer the church. As it was really, it was put very well. We don't worship the church, right? The church worships the head. We, we worship Christ. Is Christ sitting there? Is he the exalted one? And this helps us uh, so much. Every time uh, we open it up, he, he describes himself or what was another way that uh, I think I've just confused you more because y'all, it was your comments uh, that I got most of those points from uh, throughout this study. Right? We, we talked about, hey, Jesus meets us at places, right? He knows our needs. And so as he wrote to them, part of this character of Jesus, right, was that, hey, I know what you need. Or I'm really the true, right? The I salve, you remember? Uh, in Laodicea, they, they had developed, uh, you know, that I'm really the, the firstborn of creation. I'm the one who created all things. I'm the true and the faithful one, uh, he would write to them. And so there was a way in which Jesus corrected their faulty view uh, in the different places. Was it Sardis? Who was the one in the, in the rock, in the, in the crevice? Uh, they had, um, where is that? I'm going to come to you quickly like a thief. 
Yeah, Sardis. Um, I know your works. You, you have a name. He, he looks through there. Look at verse 3. Remember, therefore, how you received and you heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Well, if you go back to the character, who was it that was talking? How was Jesus represented here? He's, this, these things says, verse 1, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We went and looked uh, over in chapter 5. That there's this all-knowing God. I, I know all things. I'm right, a, a part of that. I'm going to come quickly. Remember, Sardis was, was the one that was destroyed quickly. Uh, over, they had this really powerful spot. They thought nobody could touch us. And really, two times in their history, they had been destroyed. They had been, uh, they were overcome. So, the character of Christ, it represents something that they needed. Jesus represents that for them in each and every place. And why is that important? We can't divorce. We, have you ever studied the Bible with somebody? And I'm not, I don't mean to, I'm not knocking uh, what they are. They're out there, and I think they've come from a point that, Uh, are really good, but sometimes what's missing in our studies with individuals is, yes, we we knock out of the park the doctrines of the church. We we get absolutely right the plan of salvation. We get absolutely right the the, our worship. We get absolutely right the hows and the whys. And what's often missing is the source of those. How how much time did you spend in the gospels in your conversion? These things I've written so that you may know, right? Remember John's writing, chapter 20, verse 31. Why did you write this gospel account? Why did you give us this picture of of Jesus? Because I wanted you to have eternal life. They're written down so that you may believe in Jesus, that he is the Christ, right? The son of the living God, and you may have life in his name. If you divorce those teachings about worship, about who we are from the head, Jesus then you've missed the point. You, you're going to start worshiping in your eyes. Revelation 3 and verse 17, you're not going to have a clear and complete picture of who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be doing. That, therefore, <laughs> I, I'm not making, that was in every single ch- uh, letter. In every single letter, we get a picture of Jesus and who he is, and he's emphasized as the head and as the source of, of life and the one who can correct um, any other questions there or comments? It was portrayed in the churches in Revelation, him perfectly congregation. He wants us to be a reflection of himself. He wants the churches to be better than what was portrayed in these congregations here. So right, the church does worship Christ. His desire is for there not to be as much difference as there is. That's a, gr- that's a great point. Yeah. He desires that there will be not, there's not so much difference uh, between him and between uh, the, the seven churches that they're not missing uh, in something, if I said that correctly. Great point. Yes. He wants us to be a divine reflection of him. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Uh, and we think about, uh, that reminds me, and that's going to actually segue really beautifully, uh, appreciate those comments, into something I think that we need to grasp. Uh, and if you have other comments about uh, Christ being the head and the way that was characterized in each and every letter, uh, I hope you'll shout those out or let them be known at some point in class. But think about a word that's in every letter, right? Not in every, in every letter, uh, they're commended, not in every letter. Some of them didn't get any commending. Laodicea, uh, there's nothing commendable about uh, the congregation. Not every letter got condemned. Not every letter needed condemnation. Some of them uh, were okay. They needed to, to focus on some things to make sure they didn't need condemnation, but not all of them were necessarily needing to uh, repent of anything. But all of them were urged to do something it said in verse 7, says it this way. And if you have a different translation, I hope that you'll, you'll let me know what your word is. Verse 7 says of chapter 2, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, 
I will give to, uh, to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Anybody have a different word for overcome? To him who conquers? Would else have something different? To him who overcomes? How about another one? In verse 17 he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes. I'm reading from the New King James. Do we have conquer again? Victorious? He, how, how am I going to conquer? How am I going to be uh, victorious? What is it going to take? How, how am I going to be uh, able to be victorious and to conquer? Related to the Christ, what was it that was going to enable all of these congregations to be victorious or to, to conquer? I love how it's like a con- from beginning to end. You have to go back to the beginning to find out, uh, right? It was mis- just mentioned that they had something different about each and every one. There's a different situation. There's a different circumstances. There's a different uh, thing that they needed to correct in each one. What were some of the things that they needed to correct? Okay, being lukewarm. Their attitude. Yes. They lost their first love. Lukewarm attitude. They lost their first love. What else? Yes. There's false teaching. There's false teaching going on. What else? Especially as related to the synagogue of Satan. In the congregations where there's a synagogue of Satan, remember, what was happening there? Like the Hebrew letter. What was the Hebrew letter encouraging them to do? Yeah, don't go back. They're persecuting. They're, they're, there's a lot of advantage. If we, if we go and we become a Jew again or we give up this, then we're not going to be persecuted anymore. And it was going to be very easy for them in Roman to, to give in to the Roman. There's compromise, right? That was one of the problems they were facing. Hey, if we compromise and we just give in, we go to part of the guilds, and we, you know, uh, or we, if we go back to Judaism, then we're not going to have to face this persecution anymore. What was the answer for every single one of those? Attitude, okay, yeah, to be led by the Spirit, listen to the Spirit, and it went back to, remember, the Christ. (laughs) The whole point of the book of Revelation is, I've overcome. (laughs) I've already defeated, I've already fought this battle, we've already won the battle. Christ has won the battle, so keep hope. Go over to the book of Colossians, and maybe you want to keep a hand... Uh, to me, this is amazing how this, this fits in. Look at verse 27. Colossians 1 and verse 27 says, well, maybe we'll pick up uh, in 24 so you can get the context of what he's talking about. Beginning Colossians 1 verse 24 I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in the flesh what is lacking in the affliction of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which uh, was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles. What is the mystery that's been revealed? What is this that we're holding on to? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is it that's going to overcome these battles? How are we going to be victorious? How are we going to see God want Christ in you? Here's this beautiful picture that Jesus has already conquered. Jesus has already overcome. And yet, 
we get to the point, and I think many of these, uh, the seven churches would have felt that way, like, so what? How does that translate? Okay, yeah, some of them had, had forgotten, and they, they didn't really care. How does that, how does the victory of Jesus and him overcoming translate and help me overcome? And to me, that's the seven churches of Asia. He, he's laying that out there, and he's showing them how that was going to happen. How, how was that going to, how was that going to translate? How, how was I going to be victorious based upon what Christ did. And you start to notice uh, something that, that sticks out there. To verse 27, Colossians uh, 1, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ. Yes, we've exalted him, we've seen you, but Christ in you. Christ in you. See if this makes more sense. Um, as he, he continues the argument, Colossians is a book about the exalted Christ, the Christ of the church. And he, he says in chapter 3, a beautiful chapter, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Oh, could, to me that connected all the dots. Uh, that helped me. When Christ, who is our life, appears, what was it about these congregations? What uh, did they need to know? Did you notice to be victorious, it was something different in every congregation? You say that's right. It's the same Christ. It's the same victory. But did you notice that it was something different for each congregation in order to win the victory? It's Christ in you. Christ in you. What was it that he was placing upon the seven churches of Asia? A lot of good stuff was said. I don't know if you got to hear. We have to keep it personal. There's a thing that stuck out to me. Uh, and I don't know if that's what you meant to emphasize. But that was emphasized to me. Uh, but yeah, with all the decisions that we have to make. And it can come to a point where it's just motions. Um, and, uh, but it's this personal volition. And I think something else was... Wow. There's something, some things about me that I have to forget about. <laughs> I don't know if you got to hear that. It's Christ living me. And quoting Galatians 2 verse 20, right? Uh, I'm crucified with Christ. How am I going to be victorious? And every single time there was something different uh, that they needed to know about, that they needed to fix. There's, how, how are we going to be uh, able to come when Christ is our life appear? Um, have you ever, like Laodicea, to me it's an easy one. Uh, it's all the same and it's a little bit more challenging in other places though. Did you, did, you know, we talked about how they didn't, I mean, people in town would have known that that's a church, right? 
the people in town would have known, hey, that Laodicea, that's, that, uh, that's where Christians meet. Uh, that's where those people that follow Jesus meet. Uh, that's where they meet. And yet, when Christ looks and he gives us a picture uh, of that congregation, we find out that Jesus really isn't a part of that congregation. What's wrong with that? What does that tell us and what does it help us to see? Okay, yeah. Christ isn't living in them. Uh, and I know, uh, this seems like, you know, yeah, it, it really is that simple. It really is that, but it's, uh, it's an individual. It's uh, a thing that comes down uh, to each and every one of us. It is this sense in which um, we just use Christ to get a better life. I don't know. But, um, she suggested Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. What, what did Christ tell his followers that they were going to need to do? You're going to gain life if what? Say that again. Be faithful unto death, right? He who, right, loses his life, he'll find it. But he who finds his life will lose it, right? Are we willing to, as we said a moment ago, forget about some of the things that, that I want, that I need, that, you know, I'm using as a crutch, uh, right? How often do we, we do that to say, hey, I'm going to put a little Jesus in my life because, you know, that's morally the right thing to do. If I act right, you know, God will bless me. And we tend to say, yeah, if things are going well in my life, God must be here. God must, right? Laodicea, they had more money than anybody else could ever have. The problem of wealth infiltrated several of these churches that we looked at, and they didn't realize, like Romans 2 talks about, that really what that was, the goodness of God, right, the blessing of God, was supposed to cause them to pause for a moment and honor God with their lives. Yet they were storing up wrath. Go read Romans 2. It's a powerful, really, really powerful uh, thought there. When Christ, who is our life, appears, you know, are we worshiping life or are we worshiping the God who gives it? And uh, three through seven, and I think, uh, Miss Donna, that was a perfect verse uh, that talks about and sums up in a really good way. Uh, they did not love their lives uh, to the death. And you think about uh, these churches and what they needed to know, but it was all different. That's what I keep coming back to. Um, it was different for every single one of them. And here's what's interesting, that we look at this. And I wanted to, to put that in your court, put it in my court, and think about. Um, I've just lost the verse where he told them. To be zealous. There it is, 19. I uncovered it up. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. He comes and he puts it in each of our, how are we going to overcome? Well, first of all, it's going to be the Christ. And when he's living in me, the more he pushes out the things that, that I love and that I want. Uh, but it comes down to individual. It comes down, what do you need to do? What, what do I need to do to have Christ living in me? And it's so interesting to me that I, I think about that in some of these places where they're told to repent, there's some faithful few still there, still worshiping. They're the ones that are going to hold on. They, they weren't told, hey, why don't you go to the other side of town and start a new congregation? <laughs> why don't you, you pack up your bags and, and go somewhere else? Why don't you just start talking about how bad things are uh, there? Right? What they say? Strengthen the things that remain. You personally work on what you have. It puts a lot of burden in my mind as I read through and I look at this 
on our shepherds? <laughs> How are we going to make sure the flock uh, collectively is going the way it should? Yes, individually we take up our task and we do the things that uh, we're called to do, but we submit, Hebrews 13, verse 17, to our shepherds. They're going to make some decisions that we're not going to agree with. They're going to do some things that are, are really difficult. But we have a job to Christ. And as that is, it, it falls in line uh, under them, under their authority. Um, the personal responsibility stuck out to me as I looked at that. And what's neat about it is I, I don't have to wonder. I, I don't have to wonder, am I saved? I, right? First John, he, he wrote so that they may know that they have fellowship with the Father. How they do that, right? If they walk in the light as he is in the light. If they're connected to the head. And so each and every, here's this assessment. Remember, it's like a battle. Here he makes an assessment. They're going into war. There's a really difficult thing they're going to do. What do you want to make sure happens at war? What do you want to make sure that doesn't happen in war? Second Samuel 11 verse 1. You remember studying that? Really two things, and I'll end my, <laughs> my study. Some of you are thinking, this is not how I would end the study in the book of Revelation. But I think it's, it's personal. It, it comes down to us individually. What happens when you're going out to battle? Remember, that's how we started. We said, yeah, this is a battle we're in. That It's not wrong to use that analogy when it comes to the fight and the life that we're living for Christ. It, it really is a battle. Where at? Okay, yeah, the conquering. We're conquering. It's, that's the language of battle there. And he's, remember, this, these seven letters are an assessment of the churches. So as he's assessing us, as we go out to war, what happens? Like, sec, remember 2 Samuel 11? Remember that story of David and Bathsheba? Remember how that started? It had to do with something with a war. <laughs> yeah. Listen, part of the assessment here is you're not battling. You're not at your post. You're not doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. And they're thinking, no, yeah, we, no, you're not. You're not loving the way you're supposed to love. We, yeah, but we're, we're, hating, we're hating the bad stuff. Go back to Colossians. Colossians 3. Get at your battle stations. Get on point. What do, what do you do? If you're seeking Christ, um, here's what you do. When Christ, who is our life, appears, you'll appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members, which are fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. I would say we were very good at that. <laughs> That's the part where we've done excellent. And I think we do a very good job but we just do a disservice to the doctrine of Christ. We do a disservice to the whole text if that's where we stop, right? If we're so concerned, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> and we're known for what we don't do. Uh, in Ephesus, they were known for what they don't do. They, they had built up these great walls. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. And so many other places were also. But then you miss the rest of it. What's really beautiful, what, when Christ who is our life, how do we make him our life? Well, uh, you put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is in all, uh, is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy beloved, put on what? Tender mercies, 
kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you, so, you also must do. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful. We could go on and on, but here, get to your battle stations and fight. Put these things on. The seven churches of Asia, when you read it and you study it and you open up, that's what it's calling us to do, it's calling us to be something, it's calling us to be Christ. And you can't do that by just not doing stuff, right? By just not worshiping the wrong way, by just not, uh, you know, taking of, uh, of the Lord, by just not doing things. You, you've got to go and be and put on. And there's really a challenge that you come and see. Be zealous. Repent. Change your mind. But there's also something else that comes to mind, uh, and we'll discuss these two. Um, you remember Joshua 6? There's another war. Joshua 7. Joshua, they've just beaten, they've just uh, conquered Jericho. They marched all around the walls. Uh, they win, they're victorious. Jericho is this huge fortified city. And then they go up to Ai. And you remember what happens? Yeah, 36 people die. They only take a few, like a couple thousand soldiers. Oh, we can go handle the, our business. And 36 die. And they, they went and they fought the wrong battle. <laughs> They had a battle in house that they had not taken care of. It was unbeknownst to, to David and uh, or, uh, Joshua and others, but still, it was a, a war that they did not need to go fight. And uh, that's something that was brought out to me. And maybe it's not uh, as emphasized as much, but these are seven different congregations. Sometimes we fight battles and wars are, are created that we don't need to fight, <laughs> uh, that aren't really problems at home. We think about what is the problem at West Hill, right? What is, what are, as we make an assessment, we don't need to look all over the world, and we don't need to look at uh, Ennis, and we don't need to look at uh, what's going on everywhere else. We don't need to look in other people's homes. Hey, there's an individual application there too. Are you fighting the right battle, <laughs> the, the one that you need to fight? And I think that those two things, uh, they stood out to me as we think about putting Christ as our head. Well, how's that going to happen? How is that going to make us victorious? Because it's an individual. I get to control that. Uh, it's personal responsibility. And as you think about that, does anybody have any comments about not being engaged in war or how we sometimes fight the wrong battles? Or what did you see that, that helps you? Uh, in these seven churches, it's making assessment, bringing us home. great point. Yes. Why can't we be, right, go and, and be known for those positive things and don't take away uh, from the negative. He says, I, I have no problem. I, I rebuke and I chasten those whom I love. Uh, yeah, there's going to be some things that you need to cut from your life. What is that? As you went through these, these seven, did anything reach out to you or did step on your toes in any way? Are you willing to humble yourself enough to say, yeah, with Peter, right? Peter was a little bit too bold and a little bit too uh, unwilling to admit wrong, and yet he had to learn the lesson the hard way. We're going to learn it if we don't cut and choose, right? The things that we need to change. Yeah, 
really good thoughts. And it fits. Remember Ephesians 4? Oh, isn't that neat? Go study Ephesus. Just pour your heart into Ephesus and think about the seven churches of Asia. And I know we started that when, if you were here from the beginning, but uh, he's pointing to leaders. He's pointing to elders who all this uh, burden and responsibility comes on. And what's he tell them, Right? appoint everybody, give them the knowledge and the skills. Everybody, every single joint supplies. When everybody's working together, we're unified. Go back to the beginning of that. Uh, when we're on point, when we're at our battle stations, as we could uh, definitely say in Revelation, then there's so much good that can come. There's so much power. There's so much success that happens in God's kingdom uh, when we're there. When we're on point. And here's this assessment. Here's, hey, you're not on point here. You're either fighting the wrong battles or you're not fighting the right ones. And here's this assessment that's taking place. But I've overcome. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The, the more I know about Christ. You see that passage in Colossians 1 verse 24? I, I'm filling up what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And did he not suffer enough? Yeah, no, at this body, he, he's not suffering. You remember, it was suffering and it was pain that they went through that identified them with Jesus. When I'm aligned for my faith, right? When I have to cut and when I have to make deep sacrifices, it doesn't hurt. It, it draws me closer to God. It draws me closer to Christ. It's the congregations that were in the biggest, deepest poverty or suffering the most that didn't have any condemning to do. And that ought to touch us, and that ought to show us, and that ought to just really challenge us, actually, uh, in a lot of ways. Okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're taking the wrong messages. He who has an ear, let him hear. And right, what is he talking? Here, listen to the message that, that I have for you. We're not listening to the right thing. I don't know if I'm going where you're going, but yeah, we definitely need to have more of uh, God's Word. We need to have it. How are we going to look more like Jesus? What's it going to, that's going to be able to root out of us the things that are wrong? His Word's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of my heart. The more I look at this Word, James chapter 1, it's a reflection. And, and as I look at it, what do I see? Is Jesus there? As it reflects on my life, do, am I looking more like Him uh, every day? It's a challenge. Are you challenged in your faith? Is it just, I'm just sure, if there's nothing challenging in your life, I don't think you're doing it right. I'm not doing it right. That's part, to stir one another up to love and good works. Your good example in the faith way ought to challenge us, right? It ought to encourage us to be more, to do more, get to our stations. Uh, and so here it is, you who overcome, you're right, you're going to sit with me and it, it was different, but the, you're going to have your reward, you who conquer. How do we conquer? We lay close to the head. We stay attached to him, and it's personal. And I'm individually responsible for that. Uh, a challenging study, uh, wonderful study. We could study it again uh, next quarter with a new teacher. Uh, we could keep studying, but something we need to, to learn from, incur, uh, encourage each other, that th there's some things where we're uh, where we're lacking, we need to be encouraged and filled up. But where we're strong, why don't we encourage each other? Why don't we use those? Uh, and we have so many talents here that we could use in, in a great way. But get to our battle stations. Uh, get on point. Ask. Pray. What can I do? Where can I get involved? Hey, I'm really struggling with this. Are we using uh, our brotherhood and, and using our relationships the way God would want us to use them? Uh, appreciate the study and you allowing me uh, to be your teacher and coming back. Uh, I've really been encouraged uh, by the study and encouraged by your comments and, and your help as uh, we've been studying this quarter. Thank you. Jesus.